everyone. I'm Jennifer Puck from UCSF, and with Mort Cowan, we are going to tell you about a gene therapy trial for Artemis deficient severe combined immunodeficiency that we call ART SKID. SKID is a very severe disease. It used to kill all infants, uh, but now we realize it can be treated with a bone marrow transplant from a healthy person. However, uh, infants who develop infections are much more difficult to treat. And this is data from the Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium, which is 47 centers around the US and Canada, showing that uh, treatment is very successful if given at a young age, less than 3.5 months, before babies have started to get serious infections. But these infections begin and they certainly compromise survival. And this is even uh, modern data in the last decade showing survival decreasing to around 50% if infants have an active infection at the time of their bone marrow transplant. Fortunately, now we have newborn screening for SCID in all states as of 2019, and the screening is based on detecting these little circles of DNA called TRETs that are produced from the recombination of the T-cell receptor that has to cut and paste different pieces together in order to generate the T-cell diversity that helps us fight infections. And we'll talk about this some more in a few minutes, but this byproduct of T-cell receptor rearrangement produces a very handy analyte for newborn screening. And this graph just shows that newborn screening has increased as a, a diagnostic method of SCID in the past several years. You can see the years and percent of cases uh, screened whereas the percentage of infants diagnosed by having infections has fortunately gone down. Another determinant of survival for SCID is the genotype. There are many different genes that interrupt T-cell development. And what you see on this graph, again, data from the Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium, is that the survival is the worst for a gene called DCLRE1C. And we don't like saying that uh, string of letters over and over, so it's called the Artemis gene. This was the name given to it by the first uh, group that cloned it. And uh, mutations in the Artemis gene produce SCID that has the worst survival of any of the SCID genotypes, uh, again, even modern data up to 2018. So what is different about Artemis deficient skid? This is an ultra rare disorder. Only about three to 5% of all skid and skid itself occurs in only one in 60,000 births. The gene encodes a DNA repair enzyme. And this repair enzyme is necessary in order to accomplish the T cell and B cell receptor rearrangements that I just alluded to that are required in order to make T cells and B cells mature. So this is called a T minus B minus form of skid. And because DNA breaks can't be fixed, these individuals also have increased sensitivity to radiation. There is a founder mutation uh, in Navajo and Apache Native Americans so that they have a much more frequent incidence of skid, one in 2,000 births due to a stop uh, codon mutation in the Artemis gene. Why does art skid have the poorest survival? Well, even with a matched sibling donor, which is the ideal donor for a transplant, B cell reconstitution is rare in Artemis deficiency, and even T cell reconstitution often incomplete. When there isn't a matched sibling, and there isn't in the majority of cases, alternate donor transplants have a high rate of rejection, 
poor immune reconstitution and a very high incidence of graft-versus-host disease, which we think may be mediated by those NK cells, which are present uh, even though T cells and B cells are absent. Uh, individuals with ART skid are very sensitive to high dose chemotherapy that's used for pre-transplant conditioning. And even the survivors have short stature, poor tooth development, endocrinopathies, and increased mortality. So all these things together made us decide that Artemis uh, would be a good candidate for autologous gene therapy. That is, putting a correct copy of the gene into bone marrow stem cells. We worked a lot with the Navajo and Apache uh, tribes, and UCSF has a long history of treating Navajo and Apache children with art skid. The Navajos live in very challenging circumstances, many of them far out in the country. You've heard about their awful uh, experience with COVID-19 uh, in the recent months. And some of our patients come from houses with dirt floors and no indoor plumbing. Fortunately, we have a, a trusted and experienced local physician, Dr. Diana Hu in Tuba City, who helps us uh, follow these patients. And we have sent a team to the reservation annually to hold skid clinics to follow our patients who've been treated there. But this was the first year uh, we couldn't go in person due to the pandemic. We had to have a Zoom skid clinic. Uh, our Navajos bring their traditions with them when they come to UCSF for transplants. And many of them arrive with a cradle board like this one in the picture. It just has to be uh, fully disinfected and all the bedding has to be sterilized before they can bring it into the transplant room. And despite all these things, stress levels are high, patients are far from home, and a transplant of any kind takes at least three to four months, uh, and gene therapy is unfortunately uh, no quicker. So this is a picture of our gene therapy vector, which I'm not going to go into in detail, but one important feature is that it uses the endogenous Artemis promoter to drive expression of the Artemis cDNA. And most vectors for other gene therapy have used some other type of vector, but we believe that this will give the right amount of Artemis protein in the right cells at the right time. To date, we've enrolled 10 patients and I'm not gonna have time to talk about the ones in light blue who are older individuals who've already had treatment as infants, but the treatment was not successful. The rest of the uh, time, I'm gonna focus on the uh, ones shown in darker blue here. These are newly diagnosed infants. And although several of our patients are Navajo, uh, we've been surprised to find every ethnicity has Artemis skid to one degree or another, uh, as you can see here. Our treatment protocol involves a very low dose of busulfan. This is a dangerous chemotherapy agent, but we need to use it to make space in the bone marrow for the corrected cells when we reinfuse them. And we've taken pains to do targeted pharmacokinetics for each infant to adjust their dose based on their own metabolism. And that's important. You can see here that the dose required varies by a factor of two. So if we just done a weight-based dosing, some patients would receive too much and some uh, too little. So in terms of the follow-up, uh, I'm gonna show you just the data from infants. And right now we have over 13 months mean follow-up. So first here is the vector copy number that we're observing in the T cells that develop and the B cells that develop in these infants. So each infant is shown here in a different color. 
We also see the vector coming up in natural killer cells and in myeloid cells. So that means we're getting multi-lineage engraftment, uh, which is a good indication that we have true stem cells that would be needed for durable, successful treatment. And these are the numbers of T cells, B cells, uh, and T cell subsets that we've seen develop. So these infants have almost all started with undetectable cells, because this is a T minus, B minus skin. And the cells that were present in one patient were actually maternal cells. You can see that over time, uh, after about three months, the numbers of gene-corrected functional T cells has shot up, and all the patients shown here have uh, developed B cells once they get out past three months. We are also looking carefully at the insertion site profile because we want to avoid having clonal proliferation as occurred in the original SCID gene therapy trials for X-linked SCID with gamma retrovirus vectors in France. In these cases, we're gratified to see almost all of the clones that we look at, we see only one time, whereas the insertion sites that are seen multiple times account for a very modest percent of the total cells. And the other thing that we're looking at is the diversity of the T cell receptors that these patients are generating. So as I already said, the recombination of these T cell receptor genes is what gives us the diversity of our T cell population. And we need this in order to be able to recognize all of the things in the environment that we need to respond to. And these are called antigens. So T cells have on their surface these receptors, and this is the variable region of the T cell receptor right here. And what we do is we actually sequence the RNA that is encoding that portion of T cell receptors. So you can see in uh, data from a healthy infant cord blood or a healthy adult, there is a great deal of diversity. And this diagram depicts uh, each unique sequence as a dot. And the size of the dot is proportional to the number of times that sequence occurred. So there's a huge variety, very little predominance of one clone or the other in either cord blood or adult blood. We measure this with something called the Shannon index, which is around 9.6 or 9.8. And here is patient 007 who we treated with gene therapy. He started off with essentially no T cells and extremely low diversity. But by three months, you can see T cells starting to develop and a good amount of diversity beginning to be detected. And by six months, he's already got a Shannon index of nearly as much as the uh, adult and cord blood donors. So in conclusion, to date, we've treated 10 patients with our autologous corrected CD34 stem cell preparation. And we have had no serious adverse events, no rejection, no graft versus host disease. and um, the low dose busulfan targeting appears to be working well. We have not had toxicity from this. And our preliminary studies indicate significant diversity of insertion sites with no dominant clones and also diversity of the T cell repertoire that's developing. We have had two patients who developed autoimmune hemolytic anemia, uh, a temporary complication likely associated with early B cell reconstitution. And we are following these patients. Uh, we've treated them successfully and um, we're looking into why this happens. We clearly need to enroll more patients and follow them longer to know if this is going to be a fully successful treatment, but we're very optimistic at this point. And I'd like to end just by thanking all of the team at UCSF and our NIH collaborator, Harry Malik, Scott McIver, who helped us make the vector, and doctors who referred uh, patients 
to us as well as the patients and their families. Thank you very much.